one thing that I wish the public knew about patent applications was just literally keeping it secret until you've got some advice. So you came up with an invention for a new type of stapler. If you get a patent grant, then you've got something that you can say, hey, that's actually my design, you totally copied me. Welcome back to another episode of A Kiwi Original. Today on the show, I'm joined by Sarah Barkley from AJ Park. This is an organization that sits behind businesses and secures the intellectual property or IP of an organization. So when you go to market and competitors start joining in your industry, you've actually got something to protect and you've got an individual unique number that tells other people that this is a patent or a trademark or a copyright. So welcome to the show, Sarah. Hi, Ryan. Thanks for having me on the show. So should we start with a a basic one, um, which is what is IP? What is intellectual property? So intellectual property, there's two main types. So there's registered intellectual property, which is what a lot of people know about. So that's patents and trademarks and design registrations. And that's where you file something at the patent office and get a number like what you were saying. And so you can get those numbers in New Zealand and overseas. And then there's also unregistered intellectual property, which you get automatically. It's not things that you protect by registering them at a patent office. And that's when you have things like copyright and trade secrets. So the two types, one, you don't really have to do anything. There's uh, there's some automatic rights that you get mm-hmm. over your art or your invention. Um, why would a business go that extra step and actually make an application for a patent, for example? So the main reason why you would uh, register something rather than relying on unregistered rights is that it's usually easier to prove that you have those rights by because you get a date at the office and also you have some official documents that you can rely on. So that's why um, getting a patent application can be better than relying on uh, either your confidential information or copyright and trade secrets because, yeah, you've actually got a number and a date that you can prove that you came up with something. Um, But really it depends on what a company is trying to protect because sometimes actually keeping things secret is better. So that's when you think about some famous examples like Coca-Cola and KFC, where they protected what they're doing by keeping a secret. So people have tried to reinvent Coca-Cola and KFC and never really come up with um, the recipes. And so they protected it by keeping it secret. So sometimes that is the best way to do things. But generally, for things that you can pull apart and work out how they work, it's better to actually file something. So say you came up with an invention for a new type of stapler. So an engineer could like pull that stapler apart and work out how it works and copy you and go and make it more cheaply than you and do better marketing and you've got no protection. But if you file a patent application and get a patent granted, then you've got something that you can say, hey, that's actually my design, you totally copied me and you'd um, be able to stop them with that. So yeah, it really depends on what the business has come up with whether you register or not. Okay, so an example, uh, the previous episode to you uh, is a, a company based in Invercargill and they make bipods. So these are the, the things that stabilize the end of your gun barrel when you're a hunter. And he's applied mm-hmm. for patent applications in New Zealand, in Australia, and in the US, and it's still patent pending. I think there's a, a six months to go before uh, he gets that application approved. Uh, Mm -hmm. Why does it take so long and what's the difference between patent pending and patent accepted? So patent pending means that they've filed something at the patent office. So if you've got a competitor and you see they've got patent pending, that just means that they've filed some documents at the patent office. It's hard to know if they've got a good patent or or not. So it, it doesn't really mean a lot when it's just patent pending. So it's not until it's granted that they will have some rights in that country. And so the reason for the delay, a lot of it is um, because of backlogs at the patent offices. So you will file something and for some countries it can take three years, five years, ten years until a patent examiner actually looks at it and um, comes back to us with whether they think it's patentable or not. That's a long time. 
yeah, so um, yeah, some countries are quicker than others, and it really is um, the backlog at the patent office from yeah what we see at our end. What should a business do in that period of time? Should they keep it to themselves still, or do you launch and hope no competitors come up? Does it give you any protection at all in that that pending stage? Yeah, so once you file a patent application, you get your um, priority date or a filing date. And once you've got that date, you're free to then um, commercialise your invention. So if we filed a patent application today, so that, say the bipod people filed their patent application today, they would be able to start commercialising their invention tomorrow. So they can start selling it to people, putting it on the website, telling everyone about it. So it doesn't really slow you down in terms of commercialising your product. And if you find that a competitor is copying you, there are things that you can do to speed up the process. That's interesting. So it doesn't actually, um, it's it's not going to slow you down from launching your business. There is some mm-hmm. protection uh, that's there. So when should, if you if a, a person has a, a not just a great idea, but has actually created something that's commercializable, when should they then engage with an organization like AJ Park to see whether they've got something that's patentable um, and whether the, it's actually viable to go down the patent route? Mm-hmm. So I always tell people it's never too early to talk to a patent attorney. So even if it's just a concept at this stage, it's always a good idea to um, get a patent attorney a call or have a meeting with them and find out if you've got something that might be patentable. And their advice will either be like, yeah, I think this is, this is looking good. It's in sort of the right form. You're at the right stage to think about filing a patent application. Or the advice might be, yeah, this is looking good, maybe go away and do a bit more development and know what you're actually going to commercialise and then we can um, prepare and file a patent application. But probably half the people that I talk to, we usually advise them not to file a patent application and it's not because they don't have a great idea or it isn't something that's going to be successfully commercially because they've disclosed too much in their mention. So put it on the website or fold it and then there's not usually a lot that we can do. So, oh, is that right? So, if you've actually disclosed it already, it becomes difficult to mm-hmm. patent? Yes, and that's because um, the basic requirements for patentability is that an idea has to be novel and inventive over what's been done before. So, novel means it's another way of saying that something's new. And so, if you've put it on your website, you've told it to the public about it, and so it's technically not new anymore. So, um, that's probably the one thing that I wish the public knew about patent applications was just literally keeping it secret until you've got some advice and either decided you don't want to get a patent application and then telling everyone about it and that's fine because that's your decision or keeping it secret and confidential until you've actually got something on file at the patent office. That's Um, quite a big thing that you can't reverse either. If you get that schedule of that order of things wrong, there's no way you can go back. Yeah, exactly. So there are some countries where there are exceptions where any disclosure a year before you file your patent application, you can still get a valid patent, but we'd never advise anyone to rely on that. So the best advice is to keep it secret and confidential until you've talked to a patent attorney and worked out what you want to do. What are some of the uniquely Kiwi ideas you've seen uh, that have come through and been painted? Because you you must see some amazing inventions that uh, Kiwis come up with. What what's some of the ones that maybe stand out to you that you can talk about? Um, so I guess a good example is John Burling, who you had on the very first podcast of the series. Um, so Gr- John is great to work with for lots of reasons. So he... Um, he is the epitome of a sort of Kiwi inventor. He will just work on things in the shed and come up with ideas. Um, there's a lot of great things about what he does. It's like the sort of basic concept of Brown and Law's the inventions he comes up with is around safety. So safety of motorists and people driving um, vehicles and things. So just the heart that he puts into his inventions is great. And then also... Like I was saying, keeping things confidential. John is really great at keeping things confidential until um, he's talked to me and then we'll have a chat and work out whether something's patentable or not. But he literally, I don't think he tells anyone until he's talked to me first. So that's why he's um, great to work with. And then another reason why he's 
um, really good to work with is because he makes pretty good business decisions. So he doesn't get too emotionally attached to his inventions. And if something is looking like it's not going to be commercially successful, he's happy to sort of pull the pin on it and not keep going. But other times, um, some of his inventions, they've really taken off and sell like hotcakes in, in the US. So he um, knows to put like a lot of time and energy into those projects. Yeah. When I spoke to him on that first episode, the, it just amazed me that what he had come up with with the track grip uh, was mm-hmm. something that, you know, it was basically crampons for Caterpillar or Bobcat diggers. And yeah. I said, surely those you know, massive multinational companies had come up with this already. And he said no, and they'd spent millions of dollars trying to solve it. But his insight was different. But it sounds like it wasn't just the insight that he needed. It was the insight and then patenting that so he could go to mm-hmm. those companies and say, I've got something that has a patent that you can license from me or buy from me, yeah. but, but you can't copy without uh, breaching the patent I have. So it's quite a, a valuable thing to, to, get, um, to get done. Where, where doesn't it make sense? Are there particular things um, where even if you could patent it, someone else could patent something that's 90% the same and, and come up with something some uh, way of it working slightly different? Is there areas of grey mm-hmm. that, that you advise on? Yeah, so I mean, that does come up quite a lot. Um, and also, I guess it's a bit of a misconception around intellectual property in general, is people think there's no point getting a patent because someone can change this by 10% and uh, they won't infringe my rights. And so um, there's no sort of easy answer. There's no sort of like easy percentage rule. Um, so a lot of what you do when you work with a patent attorney is um, just getting that good advice around whether it is worth going ahead or not. So what we usually do is um, research into what other people have been doing. And if it looks like um, there are a lot of other sort of products out there on the market already and actually what you're doing is only slightly different, realising that the protection you're going to get is quite specific and narrow and then just working out if it's worth protecting or not. So sometimes like a small difference can be in reality quite a key difference and enough for you to build a business around. And other times you look at it and you think, well, they'll just move a bolt and that position of the bolt is the only thing that my pay is really protecting so it's not worth going ahead. Um, so it's really sort of like a case-by-case thing and just seeing what else is out there in the market. Okay. I think I understand that a little bit more in that Although you know, we're talking about patents, not trademarks, the, the Kiwi trademark, that triangle and the Kiwi are very key elements to it. So anyone can draw a Kiwi. You know, We don't own the trademark of all Kiwis that have been uh, created in the last hundred years. There is a particular style to one that you know, we do have a, a trademark on. And I guess what, what you're saying there is it depends on how relevant that patent is for how the the product works and if it's critical versus non-critical to the working will depend on the value of the patent yeah exactly yeah Uh, what other um, inventions have you come across that are uniquely kiwi um i think that i think john is probably the only one i can talk about at the moment because you must see a lot of like the, um, uh, I guess the the applications that come across here. You've got to have quite a high level of confidentiality with your clients. I think I was reading on your website that uh, a third of Fortune 500 companies rely on AJ Park for mm-hmm. services around around IP. Uh, how do you work with other countries and jurisdictions that are outside of New Zealand, or how do companies that are paced outside of New Zealand, protect their intellectual property within New Zealand? So we work with um, patent attorneys in each country where our clients need protection. So we have um, associate firms that we work with. And so the way uh, we work with them is by sending them the details. So like John's application, we sent that to patent attorneys in Europe and the States. And they deal with the patent office in each country on John's behalf, and so they communicate with us and then we communicate back to John. So, yeah, um, 
quite good having us in the middle because we can sort of interpret things and send them back to our clients and also sort of have a good understanding of what's happening around the world. Makes it a little bit easier the for them too because it's just one uh, legal contact rather than multiple countries to work with. Yeah, exactly. Um, I'm not sure if you've ever seen patent documents or correspondence from a patent office, but unless you've you read them before, it's like another language that you're having to interpret and explain to people. Um, and just the importance of paying the fees and things on time, all of that um, is really what we do for our clients. Yeah, because I've you know gone into the intellectual property office uh, online and done searches for you know, keywords or images and mm-hmm. Uh, even with a, a decent understanding of business, it's still confusing. Like w- when something gets approved or when it's lapsed, it's not immediately obvious whether I had searched exhaustively or not. Uh, and I, I was confused whether I was seeing all the information. I thought you really need someone with a bit of domain expertise to to get to the bottom yeah. of this. Yeah. So. Um- at AJ Park and all other firms are the same as well. We have people that uh, are experts in searching. So we'll have people that are experts in trademark searching and then experts in patent searching as well. Because it's one of those things is that, um, like patents, for example, they are written in English, but if you've never read one before, it's yeah, like reading another language. And um, trademarks as well, just knowing how to search to get all the different options. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt. This won't take long. Subscribe to the show and you'll never miss another one of these amazing episodes. Right back to the show. What are the the hot industries in New Zealand at, right now in terms of where patents are occurring at a, at a, a rapid rate? Um, so generally, like sort of worldwide, artificial intelligence is becoming a bit of a hot topic. Um, and not just because people are coming with those ideas, but the sort of legal ramifications of having artificial intelligence, like developing ideas, because the patent system and all sort of legal systems based on people coming up with things and then people owning things. So when the computers develop something, working out who owns it. So that's sort of like a pretty interesting topic in the world of patents just generally. And just the lawyers like getting our head around what that means um yeah that's sort of quite interesting i saw something on this um i think it was slightly different though it was a, a monkey that took a selfie and mm-hmm. the photographer said that he owned the photo but it was ruled that the monkey owned the photo in terms of the the copyright so if, if you were to apply that to ai does that mean you could have particular operating systems saying claiming that they own the intellectual property or the, the the patent rather than the company. Yeah, so that's what I think. There might be a company in the States that's trying to do that exactly. I don't know the details. I've just seen a few articles on it, but I think that's what some companies are trying to do is um, say that the computer came up with the inventions rather than naming a person, which is what you're legally required to do. So I'm um, just interesting to see what happens with that. I wonder if there's yeah, any... The, the, yeah, sorry, go for it. Oh, sorry, that monkey case was fascinating because it was just such a great photo, right? Like the photo of the monkey taking a selfie and the idea of a monkey taking a selfie. But um, from a legal perspective, it's pretty complicated to work out um, who yeah, who would own that photo. I mean, de- definitely. And I, I don't know how you'd get a monkey into a court to defend its rights. Uh, in, yeah. In, yeah, it becomes a little bit humorous. I wonder with the on the AI side of things whether then do patent officers then look at in the the AI technology in reverse and are they able to then use AI to assess whether this invention has um, is new or whether it's existing? Can they use that in some way? Yeah, I'm not sure if that's, if any patent officers are looked at that, but yeah, that's a really sort of interesting concept. Um, because one of those things is we think as people would be better than a computer. Like I could read a patent and assess it better than a computer can. But I think um, so from the research that they've done, it's you know computers um, analysing legal contracts and doing all sorts of things. Computers quite often come out better than we do. So it's a bit hard for us to take. Um, yeah, so I guess watch the space with that one. It'd be interesting to know what happens. I'd like if there was a, an AI that could find any Kiwi that's shaped like our Kiwi in terms of the, the Kiwi mm-hmm. trademark and just find it on any website 
and then do a search based on the URL and then go through our CRM to say, is that an active license holder or not? That would save us a whole lot of copyright breach work. Um, uh, oh, yeah. It's something I'm sure that will be on the horizon for businesses wanting to uh, protect patents or protect trademarks. That type of service should, would be quite valuable. Yeah, I mean, that does sound like a pretty impressive service because, as you know, like at the moment, it's literally just people looking at things and it's um, easy to miss things and it just takes so long. Yeah. What got you into uh, patents and to, to working for AJ Park? What are, what's the type of skill set that someone needs to be good at this? So, um, as I was saying, I work as a patent attorney, so all patent attorneys have backgrounds in either engineering or science first, and that's so that when an inventor comes and talks to us, we understand their technology. Um, so I guess that's one thing to think about if anyone listening is thinking about getting a patent is finding a patent attorney that um, has the right technical background and understanding of um, your invention. Um, but most people become patent attorneys by accident. So I think I'm one of the few people that um, I wanted to be a patent attorney when I was a teenager. So when we first moved to Wellington, uh, there was a girl that I went to school with and her dad was a patent attorney and she used to talk about what he did for a job. And I just thought it sounded so amazing, the fact that he understood science and English, like that combination of skills I just thought was really clever and I just really admired patent attorneys. Um, and to be honest, I forgot about that dream for a little bit and um, went and did engineering up at Auckland University and got my first job up in Auckland and then transferred down to Wellington. And as you know, like manufacturing was starting to disappear a bit in Wellington, so um, there's just a job advertised in the paper for engineers to retrain as patent attorneys and that reminded me of my dream. I've always wanted to be a patent attorney, so that's um, part of how I got my job. Um, but yeah, so most people end up as patent attorneys completely by accident and it's because um, most people will have either an engineering or science background and have studied that um, and then sort of accidentally sent a job for a, a patent attorney and um, retrained. So once you um, start working for a patent attorney, you then have to spend sort of three or four years. It's similar to an apprenticeship, so like wow. doing the job and learning it um, at the same time as you're sitting exams and getting qualified. Yeah. You've got to really be passionate about it to want to then spend that amount of time getting the domain expertise. Is there uh, people within the organization who have been there for you know, a significant amount of time that uh, you can learn from their experience or is it more like uh, becoming a valuer? There's a, a set of skills that you just need to acquire through training. Yes, so it is um, skills that you acquire through training and uh, so that's the way we work. Like you're always, as you're, when you're a junior, um, learning to be a patent attorney, you're always working with a senior person um, so sort of teaching you the ropes and explaining to you how the law works and um, how to look after clients and things like that. Because it can be quite hard um, as either an engineer or science scientist relearning law because it's just um, so different to what we're used to. Learning how to spell because, like, generally engineers and scientists, we don't not such good spellers. So, um, yeah, working with lawyers who have um, amazing English. Once, once you've approved an application um, and uh, it's been accepted, and then you know a few years down the track, a manufacturer or a business owner says, "Hey, I think someone's infringing on my patent." Um, mm -hmm. What happens then? So, um, what we would do then is actually um, spend a bit of time actually analysing what the um, competitor is doing and checking it against what we filed at the um, and got granted as a patent to check that it is actually an infringement. And then usually the first step is uh, we would write a letter to the other side um, letting them know that we have a patent. And it's amazing how often just getting a letter from a lawyer or a patent attorney can sort of scare people and stop them doing things. So um, that's usually what happens. So I guess, I mean, there's something else is that New Zealand's not the most litigious Sort of cultural um, country compared to the states, where I think like, that happens a lot more often. I've certainly seen that from the trademark side of things. A, a letter in, uh, letting Kiwis know, because sometimes that uh, idea that you can trademark or you can secure intellectual property, that isn't well known. Uh, as 
as definitely as it is in the US. Um, is there a downside though with patents and trademarks then that you have companies that just go out to uh, secure intellectual property but never actually want to use it? To um, That actually slows down innovation by big companies collecting uh, IP without actually releasing it? Yeah, so like I know there's that theory of um, you know companies sitting on patents, so it's not something I've ever experienced in my career. And uh, I guess the other aspect of that is like a lot of countries do have legislation saying that if you have a patent, if you're not using it, you have to let other people use it. So yeah, the theory around patents isn't that you can just sit on them. So yeah, in most countries you can actually be made to use it or if you don't use it, let someone else use it. That's a fair rule. Use it or lose it. Get it out there and yeah. keep the human race evolving. Yeah. Is there anything else, Sarah, that I haven't asked you or that I should be asking you about AJ Park or about uh, patents in particular? Um, so I guess one thing is just thinking about for your listeners like what they might forget about intellectual property. So one thing I usually tell people is that they'll have more intellectual property than they realise. So there'll be something that they've been working on today that will have some intellectual property in it that they won't realise they have. So it might be something unregistered, so it will involve either copyright or trade secrets, confidential information. So you need to think about um, whether that's protected in some way. Is it the practical steps that you're doing yourself, like making sure your confidential information is actually confidential and you're keeping it secure and people don't have access to it and also just checking that you own the intellectual property that you're creating um yeah so that's just something that i think people should think about is um, quite often people think about patents and trademarks and think that's the you know big companies that are really developed and they know what they're doing but the minute you start working on anything you've got some intellectual property so mm. just keeping good records and making sure that's all protected I think that's a really good point because the the factories or production plants I've been into, whether they're just five people or 200, 300, mm -hmm. there's always some area where they've created and devised a way of working. It's a process. So it's not the finished product, but it's a process that creates an element of the finished product that it just blows my mind sometimes how they've come up with something. And when you see the finished product, you have no idea what goes into certain elements of it and certain, uh, you know, might be process seven to 10 out of a 20 step process. Should they be thinking about patenting those particular sub processes or is it just the end product once it goes out to consumers? Yeah, so there's a couple of things to think about. Like the first one is if you've got a special process is working out if it's something that you can keep confidential. So like similar to like, um, KFC and Coca-Cola like we were talking about before like if it's something that you can keep secret forever that's actually a really good way of protecting a process um, and the reason behind that is patents expire after about 20 years from when they're filed so if Coca-Cola had filed a patent for their recipe then now we would all have the recipe but the patent would have been published and there wouldn't be anything they could do to stop us um, so yeah, the first thing to do is think like, can you keep the secret or is this something that the public can see? Because if you can keep it secret, that's usually a good thing to do. Um, but yeah, processes are things that you can get patents on. That's what you want to do. That's a, a very interesting look at some of the intangibles that go alongside manufacturing. And, and I think something that we could capitalize more on in New Zealand, because once you've got that patent, as you say, you've actually got something of potential value, um, not just to protect mm -hmm. the business while it's running, uh, but for business owners that look to exit, you've got something to sell. You've got a you know a patent approved or you've got intellectual property you can point to uh, that maybe the competitor in that particular segment or market can't point mm -hmm. to. So I, I think it is something to look into. And very much for the new businesses, I think post COVID, there's going to be a lot of new innovations that come out where people are seeing problems that they can solve. Uh, and that's a great moment in time to actually patent it when things are small uh, and not many people are looking at what you're doing. It's usually mm -hmm. two or three years down the track when you become very successful that sometimes you think, oh, I wish I had done things differently. So this, 
this podcast for those businesses is the wake up call to actually do it before you put it on your website or that opportunity is gone forever. Yeah, that, um, definitely. I agree. Like, that's the only thing people remember from listening to this podcast is keeping it confidential. Um, that would be great. Sarah, what's the best way for someone uh, in business to either get hold of you or to engage with AG Park? And um, so there's a few things um, people can do. So um, if you look at AJ Park, there'll be a contact us box that people can fill in and that um, will come through to one of us. And also uh, on the website, there's everybody's profile or the professional staff has a profile. So depending on your um, your business, you can look at the profiles and find the person that has the right technical skills for you're after. And then if, um, if you're still not sure, definitely give me a call and look up my profile and um, I'll put people in touch with um, the right expert at our firm. Very good. I'll make sure in the show notes that your details are in there and also the link through to AJ Park. I think it's ajpark. What's the dot com dot com, .com. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. look through to the patents area. There's a plenty of other areas that AJ Park looks after, such as trademarks, uh, copyright, geographical indicators. If there's something you've got going on there or even plant variety rights, which I, I briefly saw and thought, I wonder if some of our New Zealand growing uh, license holders actually have plant variety rights in the space, particularly with some of the genetic work that's going on. But that's not your oh, yeah, area, so we can't talk about that. No, <laughs> um, that's, that's not my area. But um, yeah, there's someone at um, some people at AJ Park that's exactly what they specialise in. So yeah, um, if that is something that people have, there's definitely people at AJ Park that can help. Very good. Well, thank you very much for your time today, Sarah. Appreciate it, and uh, for okay. sharing your knowledge on patents. I think it's a it's an area that businesses can get involved with at any stage, particularly the entrepreneurs who are still at the idea stage. We do need more mm -hmm. intellectual property in New Zealand. The more of it we have, the more we can license, franchise, or sell outright, or monetize. Um, all of those things are, are good outcomes for New Zealand businesses. So I really appreciate the work you're doing at AJ Park to protect those on behalf of business. Cool, great, thanks. This has been a Kiwi original brought to you by the New Zealand Made team. Thanks for watching. Uh, the New Zealand Made trademark is used by over 1,200 businesses in New Zealand. Uh, the New Zealand Made team licenses that trademark. Check if you're eligible at buynz.org.nz. If you feel that someone should see this, share it with them now. Otherwise, subscribe to youtube.com forward slash buynzmade and we'll see you on the next episode.